Originally from the East Coast, Tanya Dibbs moved to Aspen in 1989 and now specializes in creating large-scale Western landscapes. Currently living in Basalt, Tanya's work has been shown not only in Aspen, but across the United States. I think I just wanted to live in the mountains and I didn't really know what didn't fit about the East Coast, you know, Washington DC suburb lifestyle for me. I wasn't experienced enough to know what didn't work for me there exactly, but I got out here and I just loved it. I was like, oh my God, this is the place for me. There's so many interesting people. There's so many people who are good at so many things. And I just loved it. I fell in love with the place. When I first got here, I did everything. I, I taught skiing right from the start. I cocktail waitress. I drove a cab. I cleaned. I catered. The things that stuck were um, construction, which is strange for a girl to do, but I wanted to be outside and I liked working with my hands. And that really helped me a lot in my art career because Aspen is a place that's expensive and it's hard to find places to live and places to work. So in the early years, I could always fix a place up and use it for studio. And most of my early studios and homes didn't have plumbing or you know, kind of shacks that I fixed up. And I really always had a dream of doing the artwork, but I don't think I had the confidence at the beginning to say, I'm going to be an artist. But I do have to say that it was a secret plan in my head. I was a ski instructor and I became friends with a client who um, asked me one summer what I was going to do. And I had always done construction, which took a lot of time. And I said, I don't care if I have to eat out of a dumpster this summer, I'm just going to do artwork. And he actually sent me a check, I think it was for five or six thousand dollars. And in those days I could live on that for a long time. <laughs> so I did and I just painted. I didn't have to, you know, spend so much time working. I painted and he picked his favorite work at the end of the summer, some paintings that he still has. They're still good work. And that was just that really helped me get going. I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened without him, but I love that story because it's true and it's kind of an Aspen story because it's the type of place where things like that actually happen. I think when I moved out here, it definitely changed the way I paint. I think the big sky out here and just the sense of space of the West really did affect the way that I paint and the scenes that I chose. And, um, I sort of, I think, became known for doing these big skies where the viewers are very tiny. I think that actually makes some people uncomfortable looking at them. Actually, some people don't like that at all when I have a very low horizon. I mean, not like this piece, but some, you know, a lot of the pieces that I have done in the past and still do sometimes are just mostly space, you know, and that is just, it's a characteristic of the West that I like. Another thing that changed was just the way uh, you're higher up in the sky and that makes the clouds look different. Back East, you know, you have the clouds, you know, the big puffy clouds, and then, you know, whatever the long, thinner ones are, and then a bunch of atmosphere, and then your horizon. And out here, I remember when I first came out, just thinking, oh my gosh, if it's really dark out, you know where the mountains start just because the stars stop, but, you know, it's right there into the sky. You're directly up into upper atmosphere, and it, it, it does look different. Interesting thing that I found is that usually the colors in the ground are in the sky and vice versa. Even colors you wouldn't think. You know, like if you just mix up blues and paint a blue sky, it's going to look like a beginner painting. The sky has yellow in it, and whatever colors you use in the sky are usually in the ground too. And it's funny, like if you take a sky that's you know, turning towards evening, say it's dark at the top and there's still a little bit of orange at the bottom, you don't need very many colors. You do the orange at the bottom and the, you know, the deep blue at the top or the bluish gray at the top, and, and uh, the gradation of those is going to come out just like the sky does. One thing that I've been doing the last few years is using a lot of Photoshop, which I love because instead of spending all this time in your studio going back and forth, I love to take a picture. I mean, sometimes I'll have a picture, a snapshot of, you know, a couple people walking, but it's the, in the lower left corner, the sage bushes there that are really compelling to me. And so I'll cut that, crop that in Photoshop, stretch it, blow it up, change the colors, you know, and, and it kind of is a nice tool for for just getting a different vision of something. It's 
very interesting facing a blank canvas. There, there's a, a writer, I forgot the author's name, but he has a quote that says, writing's easy. You just stare at a blank piece of paper until droplets of blood form on your forehead. You know, I, mean, I love that because you know you can apply that to painting too. Usually I'll get an inspiration for an idea and an inspiration is, is amorphous. It's not really concrete. You know, it, it's, it's going to be exciting. It's going to be loose. It's going to be hipper than my last painting. You know, what hip is, if I spend too much time actually defining those things, you know, you can lose it. You want to keep that feeling. I'm always jealous of photographers because I think that they can go, you know, take the picture and satisfy, keep that mood going for the time it takes to make a picture. But when I come up to a blank canvas, okay, you've got that big idea, and then every stroke you make of your paintbrush, it turns into something more concrete that might or might not be, you know, your idea or what you thought your idea was. 90% of a painting is faith that you can pull together at the end. I think that I'm going in a little bit of a different direction with my painting right now because I, I just think it's inevitable. I guess the subject just is secondary now to how I paint it or what I'm capturing or whether it's the texture. I've been having fun with new materials. I've been mixing a lot of beeswax into the paint, almost moving towards encaustic, which has been really fun. I mean, even just using a new brush can be really fun, but I think I've been loosening up a lot and to, to loosen up with your brush stroke is actually harder than to paint, for me, than to paint, you know, a perfect elk mountain range or something like that. I actually think this is a great place to be an artist. New York is here, you know, the international clientele is here. There are people from all over the country here. In some ways, I am so glad that I didn't listen to everybody's advice. You know, you have to have an MFA, you know, you have to be in New York, you have to this, you have to that, and you don't have to. And this has been a great place for that. Another thing that's really been wonderful about this valley is just the community support. I remember my first show, my very first show in Aspen was over there on Bleecker, on a, a, a rainy, muddy night, you know, and I mean, I felt, I felt like the whole town came out, you know, and, and one of my clients was like bartending, you know, and, so, and people were helping me clean the place up and hang my work beforehand. It was like a total homegrown art show, and the response from this town was awesome, and you know what? It still is. I feel like I feel like half the town's behind me. It's such a nice feeling because people remember me pounding nails and people remember me teaching skiing and they, you know, watch the slow climb and they just are behind me in a way that I just can't even explain how great it is and how good it makes me feel.